Hello and welcome. This is James from the DSO Imager channel. And tonight I'm going to show you the uh, workflow that I used to process uh, the Rosette Nebula that was taken with my recently acquired 65 PHQ, the 65 uh, quintuplet refracting telescope from ASCAR, and also the ZWO ASI 533MC. Uh, what you see here is how it looked right after it stacked, right? So uh, nonlinear, no processing done on this. Uh, this image has a little over eight hours of total integration time. It's um, 505 60 second shots. Now I did use uh, PixInsight to do the stacking and the script. Uh, that I use doesn't auto crop at the end. So there's no reason for me to do a crop, which is usually my first step. Uh, so as you can see here, there's no um, stacking artifacts on the edges or anything like that. So the next thing to do is to run dynamic background extraction. Now on a field with so many stars, it can be pretty difficult sometimes to figure out exactly where to place your uh, background reference points. Um, so what I've started doing is I'll do a, um, a uh, run star exterminator and remove the stars right off the bat. In uh, this I use then as a reference to figure out where to place my reference points. And once I've determined that for dynamic background extraction uh, then I'll save that process and actually run it against this this one with the stars in place. Because ideally we want to have uh, dynamic background extraction run pretty much very early in the processing. And then after that uh, we would want to do color calibration and then we run Blur Exterminator. So the thing is Blur Exterminator works best with dynamic background extraction already finished and then color calibration. And you want to do dynamic background extraction before color calibration because dynamic background extraction can impact the colors. So you can see what I have here is this is what the starless, this test starless version look like after running dynamic background extraction against it. And then here is the original version, what it looks like after running dynamic background extraction. And so after doing the dynamic background extraction, I ran color calibration. And so this is what it looks like after color calibration was completed. And for color calibration, what I used was the, um, the spect spectrophotometric uh, color calibration. Now, in order to get this to run correctly, you do need to uh, run a image solver script. And that is in here, image solver. And what the image solver, the way this works is you basically do a search for your object in here, NGC number, the Messier number, or whatever works. Uh, and then you give it an approximate date time. It doesn't have to be exact. And uh, this is the most important part right here. You want to make sure that the pixel size and the resolution or the focal length match what the image was taken. Uh, and then it'll solve it and embed that data into the image file. And then when you run uh, the spectro, spectro photometric color calibration, it'll use that information uh, and um, from the uh, Gaia da database. Don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it'll use that information uh, to get a really good color calibration. And then after that, I ran um, Blur Exterminator. So that's with Blur Exterminator. And Blur Exterminator does a great job, right? It's, it, it's generally uh, really good on long focal lengths. But, you know, if your data is good at wide field, short focal lengths, 
Floor Exterminator still does a nice job. I mean, take a look in here. Not just at the stars, but at this structure in here. And yeah, really, really nice. There's good resolution. So after Blur Exterminator, uh, the next thing would be to remove the stars. And you can see this right here. The stars have been removed. And, uh, and then after the stars are removed, I'll do a stretch. Uh, usually I'll just use the easy processing suite, soft stretch. And then you can see some initial curve work uh, being done here. Now, the thing is, I was still seeing a bit of a gradient uh, in the image. Now, you don't normally run dynamic background extraction after the image has been stretched, but it is an option in rare occasions. And I ended up doing it just to see how it would, would help. And uh, this is what I got. So I decided to run with this. It did a really nice job of pulling out all this information. Basically, taking this image and defining new background points yielded this. So then it's just a matter of curves work again. I really didn't do a whole lot of processing on this image. Uh, some mask work, but not a lot. A very subtle work here. Uh, I did want to pull some of the green out that was in this uh, center part. Yeah, I mean, again, this is all just basic curves work. Uh, set up a mask over there. Uh, probably was working on um, unsharp mask to sharpen everything up a little bit. Oh, you see this over here? Uh, this is so this is using that enhanced uh, dark structure enhanced script, which I sometimes run. Uh, it's this guy over here. Now, this slider here is what you use to control it. If you leave it on the default settings and run it, uh, what I find is sometimes it makes this area too dark and you end up losing some of the faint details within the dark structure. And so I usually dial it back, but it's a trial and error thing. And uh, there, so you can see, like, look right in this area right here. And there. So, yeah, it does a nice job. Notice that there's uh, no mask in place. You can't run that script with a mask in there. It'll give you an error. And uh, yeah, I think I ended up uh, right here. Uh, so next uh, was some work on the stars. So here the stars are in a linear state. And uh, I start off with uh, a couple of arc sign stretches. So you can see the difference here. So the arc sign stretch helps keep the core, cores of the stars from getting blown out. But you can't stretch the stars all the way because you start to get kind of like weird artifacts in the center. And so I just do it to help with the initial stretch and then I use regular histogram and you can see quite a difference there so now all those artifacts are gone and still stretching stretching some more now uh, increasing saturation to get some color back in there increasing saturation more and more <laughs> and then inverting and the reason I'm inverting is that uh, even though these stars were color corrected uh, 
you get a little bit of magenta or purple starting to show up. It's what happens if you push a saturation too much. If I didn't push a saturation too much, uh, you wouldn't get this. Uh, but I like to get the stars really colorful because you do lose some, some of that color when you recombine them. And so by oversaturating the stars, it allows some of that color to show through afterwards. Oh, that's uh, that's one of my cats, uh, Zena. Say hi, Zena. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what I did is uh, I inverted. All right, and just like we do with narrowband, <laughs> we subtract green here. So I use the SCNR tool to subtract green. So, yeah, I mean, we can see some greenish in there. Subtract green and then invert back. And now we have really nice broadband stars and then it's just using the um, pixel math script uh, that is recommended by Russell Croman and star exterminator uh, to put them back together and uh, nope not that one uh, that gives us this here actually I think so this is what I ended up with and then I took this into Photoshop and tweaked it a little bit more. And I also used Noise Exterminator. And uh, here's the final image. So I'm really happy with how this image turned out. The color looks great. Uh, the scope's doing an excellent job. Uh, I'm loving the nice tight stars that it's producing. And I mean, really, for a 65 millimeter scope, this is pretty good detail that we're getting in here I've shot this target before with uh, w at short focal lengths with um, in narrowband but I've never shot it in broadband like this before and so with uh, without the moon and only having a one-shot color camera I thought it'd be pretty good to see how this performed with a decent amount of data and I mean just eight hours it's not bad not bad at all So I'd love to hear what you guys think of this image and this workflow. Uh, drop a note in the comments. Uh, if you uh, found this video searching for examples of the 65 PHQ, uh, this would be a good time to hit that subscribe button. Uh, certainly more videos to come with that scope. It is uh, one of three rigs that I'm currently running and uh, it's actually out there right now collecting data on something. So with that, I'll say good evening and clear skies.